Hello and welcome to this tutorial on the basics of relational frame theory, focusing on language and cognition from an RFT perspective. So this tutorial is adapted from the first part of chapter one in Mastering the Clinical Conversation, Language as Intervention. You can find other resources on the clinical applications of RFT at languageasintervention.com. In this tutorial, you will be introduced to relational frame theory, contextual behavioral science, and functional contextualism. You will also learn about the importance of language in therapy and how RFT approaches language and cognition as a learned behavior. So the way we learn most of what we know about clinical work often starts with some historical context and a lot of theory. Students at school, in particular in psychology, often complain about the amount of theory they have to go through before they can actually learn something practical and eventually actually practice in clinical setting. So I think a lot of therapists learn to dislike theory because it feels like it's the, the boring part that you have to go through before the fun begins and you realize that it doesn't matter whether you understand or remember anything about the theory. It reminds me of the old way we used to learn to play video games. There were big manuals you had to read before you could actually play. But if you were too impatient, you would just jump in and start playing and learn how to use the joystick as you played. So in this tutorial and the others on languageasintervention.com, there will be a fair amount of theory, but the point is not to burden you with lots of concepts uh, just for the sake of knowing the theory per se. No, uh, here the point is to help you know the principles that guide your practice so that you can use these principles directly in your work. In a sense, we can say that theory is where art and science merge because that's what helps you do your work with creativity and flexibility with your own style while still being consistent with the science underlying your work. So let's learn more about the theory that we will be using here. First, I'd like to situate relational frame theory in a larger context. If you look at this pyramid, you can see that RFT is only a subcategory of something bigger, which we call contextual behavioral science, or CBS. Contextual behavioral science is defined as a holistic branch of behaviorism that aims to predict and influence behavior using principles and analysis that are high in precision, scope, and depth. In simple terms, it means that this science is interested in understanding and influencing behaviors through principles that are precisely defined, apply to a wide range of phenomena, and are consistent with other levels of analysis, such as biochemistry. If we go down the pyramid one more level, we see that CBS is grounded in a philosophy called functional contextualism, which proposes that behaviors can only be understood in functional relation to their context. It means that when contextual behavioral scientists try to identify principles, they do so by looking at the relationship between behaviors and contextual variables. RFT comes into play as the branch of CBS that studies language and cognition. And if we keep climbing our pyramid, we see that RFT can be applied in the form of contextual behavioral therapies. As you may know, acceptance and commitment therapy is the most classic approach associated with RFT. There are lots of other forms of therapies, or at least some of their techniques, that we can include in this category, such as functional analytic psychotherapy, dialectical behavior therapy, or compassion-focused therapy, to name just only a few. So let's clarify a bit uh, what we mean uh, by a, a study of behavior in functional relation to its context. What we call the context is anything that can influence a behavior. It can be things that precede the behavior, which we call antecedents, or things that come after the behavior, which we call consequences. Antecedents trigger our behaviors, while consequences reinforce or weaken their probability. For example, if we consider the behavior of eating a piece of chocolate cake, it can be influenced by feeling hungry, which is an antecedent, and it can be influenced by the taste of the cake in your mouth, 
which is a consequence. If it's a good cake, you will be more likely to eat it again in the future. And if it's not good, it's the opposite. You probably won't eat it anymore. So the nature of these antecedents and consequences is various. Some might be situational. For example, the place where you are, where you are uh, can influence whether you will eat the chocolate cake. I imagine uh, you might do it in the kitchen, but you won't in the shower. Some might be intrapersonal, such as your thoughts, sensations, emotions. If you feel anxious, perhaps you will be more likely to eat some chocolate cake, for example, especially if after eating it, you feel less anxious, which is a, an intrapersonal consequence. There are things that are in the intrapersonal, interpersonal context, such as being surrounded by friends or by colleagues at work. Again, this might influence the likelihood that you will eat some chocolate cake. The social and cultural context, your developmental and learning history, and even the genetic and epigenetic factors are all parts of what we call the context. And they can all potentially influence your eating chocolate cake. Okay, so the main point here is that our behaviors are influenced by the context. Remember, remember that the goal of CBS is to predict and influence behaviors. So, based on what we just saw, we can draw the conclusion that if our behaviors are influenced by the context, then we can change the context in order to change our behaviors. Perhaps you know about this trick to help you eat less. You put the same amount of food in a smaller plate and it feels like there is uh, more, so you end up eating less. You change the context in order to influence the behavior of eating. There are two main ways we can alter the context. The first way is concrete, or direct, we could say. It means we actually change the physical environment. The picture on the left shows the cell in the prison of Alcatraz in San Francisco, in which the only prisoner who ever escaped this jail dug a hole. We can say that uh, he concretely changed his context in order to make escaping more likely. On the picture on the right, you see uh, Nelson Mandela, who spent almost 30 years in prison. He never physically escaped, but he was able to create a symbolic context that made uh, this time in jail more acceptable. He made this time about compassion and uh, understanding. He linked his life in prison to his values. In a way, he was not behind the bars anymore, symbolically at least. So for the most part, psychotherapy relies on a symbolic alteration of the context. We pretty rarely access the direct, concrete environment of our clients, but we talk with them about things going on out of the therapy room or in their mind and, uh, and body. Of course, there are times when we directly touch the physical context, like when we do an exercise of exposure to a physical situation, for example. But even in these cases, we end up talking about what the client feels and thinks, which can only be touched through a symbolic exchange. In other terms, through talking and listening. Let's take a concrete example. Imagine this client has a, an addiction to alcohol. We could remove alcohol from uh, his uh, physical context. But can we remove thoughts about alcohol? Can we uh, remove uh, advertisements for uh, alcohol? Probably not. What we can do is alter the way the client responds to these cues. And a big part of this work will consist of changing the meaning of these cues. That's what we mean by altering the symbolic context. And that's where RFT is useful to us. It's a contextual behavioral approach to language and cognition, which can help us get better at doing symbolic alteration, or in simpler terms, at using language for the purpose of influencing behaviors. So to finish this uh, tutorial, we'll just say a few words about RFT and we'll explore the main concepts in the next tutorial.
So how does RFT approach language and cognition? Well, for RFT, language and cognition are behaviors, so it means we are going to approach them like other behaviors in functional relation to the context. It's something that is perhaps surprising if you are completely new to RFT, but we consider that language and cognition are things we do. We think, we speak, we listen, we conceptualize, we imagine, we dream, and so on. Those are behaviors that are influenced by the context, like other behaviors. For example, an antecedent like being surrounded by strangers might make it more likely for me to think, I don't know anybody here, I don't feel comfortable, I'd rather leave this room. On the other hand, I might think about the connection between my current action and one of my values. For example, doing this training and my value uh, sharing my knowledge and uh, as if this consequence, uh, if I enjoy this consequence, um, then I might be doing, uh, doing it even more. And so it's likely that I'll make this connection again in the future. So language and cognition are like other behaviors in that sense. However, they are not exactly like any other behaviors. So let's see what kind of behaviors they are. First, we need to, uh, to note that from an RFT perspective, language and cognition are not really two different behaviors. We often say language and cognition, but it's just to remember that we are covering a vast area, including speaking, listening, and thinking. So in general, we will talk about language as a generic term for both. Language is the learned behavior of building and responding to symbolic relations. So let's break down this definition a little bit. It's a learned behavior. We already saw that in the previous slide. It means it's something we do and it's influenced by the context. This behavior consists of building symbolic relations. For example, when I say to a client that feeling anxious is normal, I build a relation of coordination between anxious and normal. So now they come together. Being anxious and being normal are in the same box, so to speak. We say it's a symbolic relation because there's nothing that uh, intrinsically brings together being anxious and being normal. In some cultures, being anxious is seen as abnormal. It depends on how we think about anxiety. So if it depends on how we think, then it's symbolic. If it's independent of what we think, it's intrinsic. For example, a black cat and a black dog can be put in a relation of coordination based on their color. Their color doesn't depend on our interpretation. It's not symbolic. And finally, we said that language is about responding to symbolic relations. If I say to a client that anxiety is normal, it can influence the way he will respond to his anxiety. He might not try to suppress it, for example. If instead he thinks that anxiety is abnormal, he might respond by suppressing it. So the way we arrange our world through symbolic relations influences the way we respond to the world. And remember that the way we arrange the world through symbolic relations is a behavior influenced by the context. So in therapy, what we observe most of the time is that the therapist's language is the context that influences the client's language. You can see on this picture that both therapists and clients have their own networks of symbolic relations and they interact with each other. This is the process we are going to explore step by step throughout the tutorials you can find on languageasintervention.com. So here is a summary of the main points you've learned in this tutorial and that I encourage you to remember. RFT is a branch of contextual behavior science which is grounded in the functional contextual philosophy and can be applied in the form of contextual behavioral therapies. In order to change a behavior, we need to alter its context. Language is central to psychotherapy. It consists for the most part of symbolic alterations of the context, which is very convenient when more concrete alterations are not possible. In RFT, language is the learned behavior of building and responding to symbolic relations.
So this is the end of this tutorial on the basics of relational frame theory, focusing on language and cognition from an RFT perspective. So this tutorial was adapted from the first part of chapter one in Mastering the Clinical Conversation, Language as Intervention. If you want to watch the next tutorial on the steps of learning language and cognition, you can go to languageasintervention.com. You will also find other resources on the applications of RFT for clinical practice.